My name is Dado, and today we talk about measuring and evaluating color and what to do about LEDs. Cameramen and lighting people of older generations were accustomed to determine color specifics and characteristica with so-called color meters. Many of us used Minolta color meters. Now the same meters still exist under the name of Kenko and those meters are still perfectly valid for measuring and evaluation of light sources with a continuous spectrum, like the sunlight and halogen light. For light sources with a discontinuous spectrum, these meters were not accurate, but still with a little bit of interpretation gave valuable hints for the camera work and for the possible necessity of correction with filters, be it gel filters on the lights or camera filters. The reason why these meters cannot be accurate with discontinuous spectrum of fluorescent light, HMI lights and such, is that these meters are so-called tri-stimulus meters. Three equal sensors look through very special filters, like through three very narrow windows, pointed at individual points of the spectrum. Therefore, if the spectrum is continuous, this method gives an accurate evaluation for sunlight and halogen light. But when light sources with a discontinuous spectrum don't show all colors with equal intensity, but rather with individual color peaks and valleys, or even completely missing colors in between, then these measurements are hit and miss and at best can give some very rough idea. Now we've all learned to live with these imperfections and learned how to interpret them using the values gained to make the best possible corrections and exercise caution. For LED light sources, such meters are totally useless and give wrong results because of the specific spectral characteristics of LED light sources. If we want to study and evaluate the characteristics of LED light sources, we need to turn to spectrum analysis, where we're looking at the entire spectrum and take many samples. The visible light ranges from about 400 nanometer in wavelength to 750 nanometer. If we work with a spectrum analyzer, which measures every two nanometers, we will gain something like 175 results relating to the different points of the spectrum. And that is good enough to give us valuable information. Spectrum analyzers, as they're used in scientific institutes, are relatively expensive and bulky. Today, however, there already exist some portable spectrum analyzers which can give us valid and often correct information. Now, without going too deeply into the details, there are several options. We have co-developed a spectrum analyzer called ASEC, which works quite reliable, but needs to be plugged into a PC, a laptop. This may be the most inexpensive version, but it will not show any results without being connected to a PC. One of the most elegant versions is the Ascense Tech, where you can disengage the measuring part from the receiver and attach the receiver to an iPhone or an iPad. This wireless connection works perfect, and with this instrument you can get a wealth of information and very good, very readable displays. Seconic came out with a new meter called Seconic 700, which also gives reliable results. And there is an even more scientific, but also more expensive version of the Seconic called the Seconic 7000. There's yet another portable instrument, which also gives a bunch of valid information from UPR Tech. 
Beyond that, there are others, but the ones that I mentioned here seem to be the ones used most often and are reliable instruments. Now, what information, what values do we receive from these measurements? First, there's CRI, Color Rendition Index. This is an older standard, which is often quoted, but it is based on a system from 1931, which works with only eight colors. And those are pastel colors. And don't give us enough information for a true and valid evaluation. Traditional CRI misses important information on colors called R9, which is red, and on R13, the skin color, and several others, which also have importance. We therefore prefer to work with an expanded CRI system that evaluates and shows 14 different colors. And here, very often we see that R9, the full red, with many light sources, shows particular weaknesses. But then, CRI is based on the response of the human eye. Our imaging devices today are mostly digital devices, and they have a different response to the colors, especially LED light. Different digital cameras may possibly all see daylight in pretty much the same way, and see halogen light identically. They may show little divergence when fluorescent light sources or metal halide light sources are used, but with LED light sources, different digital cameras can or will show quite divergent results, divergent color renditions, even if the cameras come from the very same manufacturer. An approach that brings us a lot closer to reliable evaluation of LED light sources, putting them in relation with other light sources, is called TLCI, Television Lighting Consistency Index, which was developed by Alan Roberts and meanwhile has been adopted by the European Broadcasting Union. The spectrum analysis of the above described measuring devices can be fed into the TLCI algorithms to give evaluations according to this new TLCI scale. Like in CRI and expanded CRI, the value of perfection is set to a figure of 100. And according to TLCI, Anything that shows TLCI values between 100 and 85 may be used with little or no corrections. Anything below TLCI 85 will need some kind of corrections. And anything below TLCI 60 or even 50 is not really capable to be corrected and therefore not really useful for professional imaging. Still, TLCI is a big step forward in the potential to evaluate LED color and its qualities. But I see a slight drawback in the fact that TLCI is mainly based on the response of studio cameras, being usually cameras with three CCD sensors. Whilst most of the mobile teams now are working with cameras based on CMOS sensors. A major problem that can be seen in the fact that cameras with CMOS sensors tend to show different color response towards LED light sources needing different corrections. Now, the most demanding task and method of evaluation. In our mind and in our experience, the most demanding task is to light a face, human skin, with a reference light source and on the other side of the face with the LED light to be tested and to see whether a match of color rendition of the skin tones can be reached. In many practical situations, 
this critical way of working can be avoided by using light sources of identical character. But then for the most critical evaluation, this may be the most valuable test and the most telling. In many hundreds of such tests, which we conduct with different types of skin tones, we've had for several years diverging results. We test with skin tones that we call Scandinavian and slightly warmer skin tone Mexican and a deeper skin tone from Ethiopia and the deepest one which is accessible to us is from Angola. Because quite often different skin tones and different skin textures can show different results in different lighting situations. Here's one example which shows that the Canon 5D Mark II needed a correction of one eighth minus green to achieve a perfect match, whilst the Canon 5D Mark III needed a slightly higher, stronger correction of minus green. Several Sony cameras, however, needed a plus green to provide this kind of match with a reference light. Now, what is our reference light? There are scientific methods, but we want to employ the most practical and realistic approach. As a reference light, we use halogen light sources and we test those at 3000, 3200 and even 3400 Kelvin against the LED lights. For daylight, the natural daylight is not reliable and changes all the time. In many situations, this is also influenced by various reflections. Therefore, we chose to work with a KinoFlow T12 tube in daylight, which in our experience has good color consistency and is a worldwide recognized standard in any fluorescent lighting application and is very often found in indoor and studio lighting situations. If we can match this, we already have some achievement which relates to lighting practice worldwide. Of course, a fluorescent light source never shows a full and continuous spectrum, but the KinoFlow T12 daylight tube seems to come as close as possible to daylight, whereas also some of our own HMI, metal halide lamps, have also been evaluated in CRI, expanded CRI, and even in TLCI with extremely high values, sometimes even awarded TLCI 100, which was kind of a surprise to us. So this could also be another reference light source, but inside studios, metal halide lighting is not used as often as the proven KinoFlow system. After several years of constant development work and many stages of improvement to our LED light sources, it now finally appears that we found a quality standard with all of our various LED light sources, which to our great relief give identical skin tone rendition regardless of many different types of cameras with which we conduct our tests. This for us, it's truly a tremendous relief because it took so many years of experiments and attempts to improve the LEDs until we now have good identical skin tone rendition between the reference light and our LED lights on both sides of the faces in all different skin tones with all the different cameras. Since this, in our mind, represents the most critical task for LED lighting, we finally feel quite relieved to have arrived at mastering this difficult task, which is not a solution that is needed by everybody and every day, but if we can conquer these most difficult tests and conditions, then we feel that we've come to a significant achievement. We'll talk about further implications of LED lighting in other videos.